our first presenter is, is uh, Dr. Lauren Dippenbrock, who is a citrus entomologist and an extension specialist at Citrus Research and Education Center. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Fernando, for that. <coughs> oh, sorry, my house is bad. Um, introduction. Um, I really appreciate the history of Florida citrus. I grew up here with citrus as a huge part of my childhood. So I'm really excited to see this program coming back um, <coughs> and then to support it in any way we can. So I don't have a lot of time today, but I do get quite a few interesting pictures and phone calls from people who work with the homeowners. And so I wanted to go through some of the pests that I get lots of pictures of. Um, kind of damage that they do and some ways that we can think about managing them that are more specific to homeowners because you're not going to have the whole arsenal that we have in a grove. My slides want to change, we shall see. Come on slides, there we go. All right, so the first one is public enemy number one for us. This is the Asian citrus psyllid. Most of you probably recognize this. The adults are in the picture in the upper left with a couple of nymphs. And the bottom picture on the and on the left is also nymphs with a whole bunch of honey of waxy honeydew coming off the rear ends. That's usually how we find them is all that waxy honeydew. You can see that usually before you see the nymphs. All right, so who are they? They're really small. They're mobile hemiptered insects, so they have piercing sucking mouth parts when they feed. That's how they transmit the bacteria for HLB. Um, we worry about them because they infect plants with that bacteria when they feed. And so once it's infected, the plant's always going to be infected for now. Maybe at some point we'll have a way to clean it up. But basically, when it comes to psyllids, we want to try to reduce um, their feeding pressure, both for your plant health, plants don't like to be fed on by lots of pests, and to reduce the re-inoculation of HLB. And so things that you can look for to find these, um, waxy waste products, so that white waxy honeydew, it's really obvious. It just sticks out like a sore thumb. Ant trails. We know that ants like to tend um, psyllids. So when I say tend, that basically means they're going up, picking up that waxy honeydew because it has all sorts of good sugars in it. And they take it back and feed their colony off of that. So they'll clean up those psyllids. If you see a trail of ants, you probably should check it out because it could be a number of pests that you don't want. So for the homeowner, um, how do I kill it? This is the question I get the most. Um, your best options for killing with what is in a homeowner arsenal is going to be horticultural oils and soaps. There's a couple of insecticides that you can buy at the garden store. Um, and you really want to try to target that younger life stage because it's less mobile than the adult and they, they are much, much easier to kill. So they're going to be abundant whenever you have fresh flesh coming out. That's the only place that still really lay their eggs is on feather flesh. So when you start having feather flesh, it expands a little bit. It gets a little bit easier to see these guys when they become nymphs. And you can look for them. You can Soak them in horticultural oil. So make sure you read the label. If you don't read the label, uh, you probably burn your plant. So you want to make sure you do exactly as the label says. Um, my favorite method is to squish small populations. It is extremely satisfying. They just smush right under your fingers. I do this in the greenhouse all the time. So if you can catch them early, you can smush them. Um, and probably the best option for most homeowners, you're going to probably have a garden of some sort. So there's lots of things that eat psyllids. So if you have a nice garden that has other resources to keep predators around, you can actually support enough predators in these habitats to suppress those populations. Um, and also the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, um, Division of Plant Sciences has a parasitoid release program. And next time that we uh, talk about bugs with this group, I'll talk some more about that program, but you can get some parasitoids to release also. This is one that's always fun um, because you don't usually find the bug until after the damage is there. We find these in groves and in homeowner situations where we get these gnarly pictures of fruit like you see on the bottom right of all my pictures. And that big old spot, half the time it goes to Dr. Dudney because they think it's a pathogen, but it isn't always a pathogen first. Sometimes it's this guy feeding. So these are stink bugs on the upper level and leaf-footed bugs on the bottom level of pictures. And they have these long straw-like stylets that they pierce the fruit with, they suck up some good juice, and then they leave behind a hole. And when you leave behind a hole, other stuff gets in. So lots of times we get calls that there's bacteria or that there's little bitty beetles coming out of my fruit. Well, a lot of times that's because this is already fed and left a hole behind. Um, so that's pretty typical of the damage that we'll see. We often don't see it on the younger fruit, see it on the ripening fruit and the rind is a little softer. How do I look for them? Um, just go out and look in your plants. They, they stick out pretty obvious. They're, they're kind of big bugs. They're just under the size of a quarter for the 
stink bugs, at least where the bugs are larger and much more obvious. If you get really bored, go out there with uh, a, a little uh, stick, and beat your tree, they'll come out, they fall right down. Um, how do I kill them? It's probably not gonna happen. They're very mobile, they're very fast. Um, so your, op your best option there is gonna be to reduce your other food sources for it, which may or may not be feasible in the home uh, landscape um, because they really love tomatoes and peas and other fruit trees. So they kind of move between these different hosts. Um, tomato crops, anything solanaceous tends to be their preferred host. And so once you terminate tomatoes, they're gonna move straight into whatever's there and available for them. Citrus leaf miner, this is super duper duper common in the home landscape. It's common, common in our groves too. Um, it used to be under control at one point, but no longer. It tends to get really high populations really fast. <clears throat> it's um, a very small moth, as you can see by the picture on the top left. That little bitty whitish brownish speck is the citrus leaf miner adult. They hang out in your canopy throughout the day and they lay eggs on leaves, fresh leaves. They like them nice and soft so that larva can hatch out and tunnel through that leaf like you see on the picture on the bottom left. Um, so you'll see damage from them feeding and that's kind of a little poop trail right behind it. So those are a little more obvious. One of the biggest problems with these is that similar to your uh, piercing sucking stink bugs and leaf footed bugs, they leave holes and the holes again are opening for pathogens like such as canker, which tends to be tied to this bug. And I'm sure Dr. Judy will mention that in her talk. Um, so how do I look for it? It does next to impossible unless you listen to the larvae. So there are pheromone lures and traps that you can buy on Amazon and they work actually really well. I use them as one of my field plots to tell when they're active and they just, it's a mating disruption tool. It pulls the males out of the system. So basically you put it out there, it attracts the males more so than females. And so you can go and check the sticky card in the side of it and start looking and see when you have um, males accumulating in there. And then you can think about, well, maybe I need to treat with something to prevent access. But in the home landscape, that's going to be really challenging. So you're probably going to be looking at some of the BT products if you can get a hold of them. Um, and even some of your contact lower level insecticides. Aphids also super common. These are going to move between lots of your different plants in your home landscape. Um, they're small piercing sucking insects. Some can transmit diseases. For most of the citrus varieties that you have that are in residential plantings, this should not be a problem. Um, mostly you're going to be looking at damage. They're kind of annoying. They can kill off some of your young growth if the populations get high enough. So the most obvious damage is the curled leaves that you see in the middle picture here. Those curled leaves and the feeding damage can reduce photosynthesis, but most of the photosynthetic reduction will actually be from sooty mold accumulation. <clears throat> when aphids and their, their other hemipteran counterparts feed, they excrete a lot of honeydew. The honeydew coats the surface of the leaves below them, and then that is a prime substrate for sooty mold to come in and grow on it. Sooty mold <clears throat> can be removed um, by a nice oil spray and a really thorough rinsing afterwards. Or if you're, you know, really, if you have a lot of time, go out there with a brush and you can brush it off. It's, it's extremely time consuming to do this, but doable. Um, again, how to look for it, you're gonna see those curled leaves, sooty mold accumulation. <clears throat> this is another pest that ants like to feed on their honeydew. So you might see a trail of ants going up to it. Um, and of course, the how do I kill it? Again, I really quite enjoy squishing small populations of these. Uh, for my graduate school days, it's extremely satisfying. I'm a huge fan of supporting uh, predator habitat, which I think a lot of the native gardening can do. And then if you need to, the horticultural oils and soaps and some of the residential-based insecticides can work, but you're gonna have to really good coverage with all of these materials and you really need to follow those labels. We have a host of mealybugs in Florida. I think there's 95 or more species that are endemic to Florida, so they're here. Um, and you're most likely going to see citrus mealybug or long-tailed mealybug accumulating on your trees. They're, it's pretty much unavoidable. They're out there. They're going to happen. They're small, piercing, sucking insects. They got this waxy, fluffy outer coating. Um, the damage will largely be cosmetic, <clears throat> which if you don't mind your fruit being a little ugly, it's probably going to taste just fine as long as the populations don't get super high, um, at which point your fruit can actually abort from the damage. They also will reduce photosynthesis from that city mold accumulation, just like their aphid counterparts. Um, and there has been shown to be fruit dropping grapefruit. So if you have a grapefruit tree out there, you might want to watch it a little bit more for these guys. Uh, grapefruits really don't like this pest. 
So again, how I look for it, I'm gonna look for city mold development and maybe looking for ant trails. Ants love their mealy bugs. They also like to move them around. So if you find that you have a mealy bug issue of any mealy bug species, you've got ant tending, you probably need to be looking also at some ant management and there are plenty of really good baits that can be used that are purchasable at most gardening stores. Um, and how you're gonna kill this again, you're gonna be looking at those horticultural oils to smother and the soap that will disrupt your exoskeleton. Um, some of the insecticides that you can buy might work. I haven't really tried them out on these mealy bugs yet. You can squish small populations um, and there's a lot of things that eat these. So again, supporting predator habitat is a great resource. And I think a lot of our master gardeners probably already do this. And um, there's a lot of scales in Florida. There's a whole mixture of hard scales and soft scales. So here's some of your representative hard scales. These again are piercing sucking pests, um, but they're a little more challenging because they have a hard shell that covers their adult, which makes them really a challenge. Um, you're gonna be needing to think about managing them in the juvenile stage, in the mobile crawler stage, um, which generally happens in the spring. And that can be watched for if you already know you have these hard scales on your trees, go out and scrape a little section of the tree, put a, some clear, yellow, or clear um, double-sided sticky tape around the stem, and then check it every week. When you start seeing crawlers, like the little bitty guys with legs stuck on it, that's when you should think about putting out an oil or horticultural soap. Um, they're really easy to kill at that stage, just with that contact oil even. Um, and they can, depending on the species, they can kill your tree, they can cause fruit damage. Most of the time, this is not a huge issue in residential, just because you guys tend to have so many other plants in there that it tends to already be predator population that'll take care of some of those younger scales. Soft scales, similar, piercing sucking, but these are a lot easier to kill because they don't have that hard shell on them. Um, again, city mold issue. So we'll be looking for city mold accumulation, ant trails, and same couple options there. Horticultural oils and soaps work great. Squishing can be fun. Um, and the predator habitat is super important for these guys. Eastern lovers, you are, they're just gonna happen. And unfortunately they are very damaging. They eat, like to eat a lot of foliage. Um, you'll see them chewing on pretty much every plant you own. You won't need to scout for them. They're big, you're gonna see them. And your best options for when it comes to citrus is either preventing access. So there's some tree bags that have been really nice for preventing access to new plantings. Um, they're a little pricey, but they work well if this is a pest of concern. Um, and how I kill them, I take them off the tree, throw them on the ground, smush them with my foot. Uh, most birds aren't going to eat these. They've got some nasty chemistry associated with them. And they're not great fishing bait, so just stomp them. This is another super common dooryard issue, um, orange dog caterpillar, which then becomes this beautiful giant swallowtail. So it's a caterpillar. It has multiple horrible instars. You're going to see some chewing marks um, on your leaves. And you might look around for a little bit because a little the younger instars are very, very small. Um, but chewing marks, and often you can find poop accumulation, which we call frass, just like little bitty pebbles. The, the easiest way to deal with these guys is just to take them off the tree when they're larvae, when there are these caterpillars. Um, you can either physically move them somewhere else. Most of the times the birds will eat them if you toss them off in your grass, or you can toss them in soapy water and they will drown. Uh, the spider mites are also another really common issue for pretty much any dooryard planting you're going to have. They're very small mites. We have a variety of spider mites and citrus, and I showed you two of the more interesting looking ones because most people know what a two spotted looks like. And if you don't, let me know. I'm happy to share a picture with you. They cause leaf damage. They can cause defoliation at high populations, especially when it gets really dry out, like right now. Um, I actually have populations from my field trials. How you find them. We're going to look for webbing, so it'll look like spider webbing, but kind of dense with little spots on the leaves um, so that they're stippling feeding. And how do I kill them in the dooryard? Your best bet is when you water them to actually take your uh, watering head and shoot it up under your leaves, and that's going to knock a lot of them off. And so it'll actually keep your population down. Um, in times when we have a lot of irrigation over or rain, then they're not a huge problem. But yeah, that watering from below works amazingly well. We actually do this in our greenhouse. It's a trick that one of uh, my technicians taught me, and uh, horticultural oils can work well with good coverage also. 
And rust mites, these are kind of hit or miss in the dooryard. I've had a couple of calls, but not as many as I expected. Um, they're very small mites. They're very hard to scout for. Um, you're, you're probably not going to see them without a trained eye. So at some point, I'm sure we'll have a hands-on workshop. They do cause fruit rind damage um, at a high infestation rate, which is not super likely in the dooryard. You can get um, some, some impacts on your fruit. Um, as far as like you actually can get a reduced fruit uh, quality. But the majority of the time you're gonna just see this kind of fruit bronzing, which is the picture in the middle. It's kind of ugly, but your fruit's gonna taste just fine. Um, sometimes you'll get the shark skin on the bottom left and it, that can definitely impact the quality of the fruit that you're developing. Um, your best bet is gonna be to hit them with horticultural oils. They like dry periods also, so they are going to accumulate in these drier periods. Like right now you'd probably find them and you'd probably find them again in the fall when they get dry. I actually target most of my spray trials in the fall when it's really dry out for this particular pest. Oils work great. Um, even oils in the field work better than a lot of our chemistries. So that can be a really nice option. The other great thing is that a lot of times there's a naturally occurring predatory fungus, which I suspect is probably more pre prevalent in dooryards than in the groves because you're not gonna be spraying some of the stuff we spray out there. So hopefully there aren't a huge issue for most people. I have a few minutes left on this talk before I take some questions and I had to show you my predatory insects because these are my absolute favorite part of the dooryard system and the stuff that we can think about. So most of the pests that you're going to see on your dooryard citrus, you can control by creating habitat that allows these predators to establish. And there's a suite of predators on this screen that you, that you can see in front of you on the top. There's two spiders, one of which is eating a diacrepia. Um, the picture below the one eating the diapreppies is a long-legged fly. They come in multiple colors. They're little flies, long legs, shiny bodies, amazing predators of all the soft, squishy stuff. Um, your lady beetles, which is the bottom two are on the left, are adult lady beetles. The third one from the left is a larval lady beetle. Um, those will eat most things soft and squishy. And also they, they like to munch on pollen and mold spores too, so you might see them in those areas. Um, if you go over the right hand side, you can see the booty of a, an earwig eating. Earwigs um, get a bad rap. People think they cause damage to their fruit, but a lot of times they're actually feeding on other stuff that's established in the fruit. They eat lots of soft, squishy stuff. Um, and then next to it on the bottom is a minute pirate bug. And they, in that similar, manal, similar manner, love all the soft, squishy stuff. These often will naturally recruit to your habitat. Almost everything on this picture will naturally recruit um, if given habitat. And several of them you can actually purchase if you really want to or need to supplement your, your predatory insects in your habitat. Um, so there's a lot of biological control options out there if you want to add to the system, which I think is really cool. And we also have a suite of specialist predators. And you might see some of these established. So I really wanted to show you, especially the picture. Um, I'm gonna turn a little highlighter on here. Of these guys, these are muley bug destroyers and they're often found around, these are the larval version of the muley bug destroyer and this is the adult. Um, they're often found near uh, infestations where you have muley bugs. And sadly, a lot of people think they're muley bugs and they wind up squishing them along with their muley bugs. So you don't wanna squish these guys. If you watch them, they walk around a little bit differently. Their wax colors can be slightly off from what you see on the muley bug. You want these. These are amazing predators. They're the best thing we've got when it comes to mealybug control. They specialize on them. The adults um, have an odor receptor that picks up the smell of the wax in the mealybugs. So they really tune in there. They lay their eggs um, into the mealybug clusters where they'll hatch out and feed on them. And to the best of my knowledge, they feed on every mealybug species we have in Florida. So these are great. Um, and these are actually something that is purchasable too. So if you wind up getting a really high population of citrus mealybugs and you can't get it under control, uh, we have several biological control companies where you can buy some of these from and release them if they're not showing up and you can't get your population under control. On the bottom there is Tamarixia radiata. This is the Asian citrus psyllid parasitoid that I mentioned that you can get from FDAX. So the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services Division of Plant Sciences has an entire rearing facility where they work on this, where they work on rearing this parasitoid and they make these available for homeowners. And so there's a whole dooryard program where you can actually apply and get a vial of them shipped to you. They prey on the Asian citrus still in nymphs. And basically what they do, they lay their egg on the underside of the nymph 
and the, the egg is underneath here when it's developing. It develops inside of this nymph, just kind of attached onto it, and then it pupates and pops out the top of the nymph. So if you see an, um, this little shell of a nymph left over with a hole, this beauty probably came out of it and is moving on to attack other stuff. So it's really exciting, and I always love seeing those in the field. So this is another option um, if you need some Asian citrus load control. The timing is really important because if you release it when you have all adults, they're not going to do anything. Um, but if you release it as you're getting flush come on and you're laying eggs and you have nymphs out there, those nymphs are what they want. Um, so for your home planting, um, managing with cultural controls, providing habitat for predators means giving them places where they can find other food resources. So you might have a couple plants that you know can handle some pressure from aphids. Um, and so aphids are a great food source for most of your predatory insects. Um, so you can have a couple of ornamentals around that have low levels of insect pop or pest insect populations where your predators can build up and move on to these areas. Um, there, there's whole plantings and insectaries in some places where they just try to get those predators going and they do a great job of it um, for control of pests in many systems. You can do mechanical removal. Um, so that's gonna be removing stuff mechanically like your uh, orange dog caterpillars. One of the best ways to do this is just toss them in some soapy water. All you gotta do is take a, a wash bin, put a little bit of dish detergent in there, fill it up with some water. The dish detergent breaks the surface tension so that the bugs sink down to the bottom of the water instead of staying on top, and then they'll drown in there. Um, and so you can kill them. Um, my friends in the Midwest do this with Japanese beetles all the time, and they actually make a game out of it with their kids. So you know you, you can make a game out of that if, they're, if your kids aren't afraid to grab some critters out of the trees. And of course, like I keep mentioning on the last slide, the Tamarixia option from um, FDAC. And I also wanted to show you some of the stuff that I found just at the Walmart across the street from us. Um, these are some homeowner options for control of these pests. And um, you know, there's horticultural oils like the Monterey oil um, and soaps, safer soap, which I learned years ago, the hard way if you don't dilute it right, you will burn your tree. Um, there's some particle films out there. You can get um, diatomaceous earth, follow the mixing instructions, get a little pump sprayer and spray it on your trees. There's some nice data suggesting that, especially in, in a smaller planting setting, you can deter psyllid establishment. So if you're focusing especially on those times um, when you have flush developing and you put that on there, the diatomaceous earth or kaolin, if you can get a hold of it, can all provide a nice coating over those um, developing areas of the plant where the psyllids and even other pests like aphids and scales and white flies want to establish. And for some of them, it'll actually kill them because it breaks, it um, shreds their exoskeleton, it's little rough particles on it. And for others, it just deters them from settling. So there's some good stuff there. Um, there's also some nice data coming out of uh, Dr. Vincent's lab showing where some of these particle films can actually enhance growth and development of your plant. So that's pretty cool. And I think that's also I think it's really exciting to think about ways that we can manage these issues without having to use um, insecticides in the dooryard. So um, yeah, insecticides are available for home use. Just be careful with them. As with any pesticide, you are legally obligated to read that label and to listen and follow that label. And this is my last slide, Wendy, so I can take some questions if you want. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. That was awesome. We have we do have quite a lot of questions, so I will get to them for you. Um, okay. Barbara Wilson wanted to know what a beet sheet was. Oh, you know what? I don't have it with me, but so we we buy these as entomologists. You can totally just make your own. Take an old pillowcase, make a little frame in it so it stands uh, um, taut, basically like you're gonna have like a little kite, and then just take um, your broom from your kitchen. Walk out with your beet sheet underneath the tree, bang it with your broom a couple times and see it falls down. We actually do a modified, uh, kind of a fancy version of that for sampling for psyllids in the field too, but you can spend money on the true one for entomology, but I'm cheap and I like things I can make out of my household products. So that's what I would make that out of. Great. That made yeah, I, when you go to garage sales with the entomologist, they're, they are looking for white sheets, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Oh and, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then rem oh. remember, if you're using your beet sheet to bring your hand lens and maybe a little light with you so you can visualize those insects well. Um, and then Sandy and Juan were wondering about the pheromone lures for the um, leaf miners. Uh, 
where where are those available or would they be available to the public so i bought them on amazon um i would be willing to bet a good gardening store probably has them but there are at least two different lures that are on Amazon. I had meant to include them on here, and I apologize for that. I thought I'd put them on here. Um, one day I can email them to you after. Okay. Um, one is from ISCA, and one I cannot think of the other company, but they come with a little white pyramid trap and instructions on how to put them out and the lure that goes in there. Um, it's a really nice tool. I, I, like I said, I actually use them in one of my field projects just so I can monitor um, populations to know what I need to manage when I need to spray for them. Right. Um, there's also insecticide based ones, but I don't think those are available in the home landscape yet. So the lures are nice. They're great. They can also just help reduce the population in general by taking the males out of the system. Okay, awesome. Um, and then speaking of those kind of controls, uh, do, does no low bait help with the eastern lubber grasshopper? I am not familiar with no low bait. I will have to look that up. I think it might be a nosema. It might be a biocontrol parasite. I have no idea. I haven't actually used anything that works on that no. grasshopper. It is one of the things that we try so many things and nothing. Yeah. Really it's um uh, it is the it's the nosema locuste. Um it's a pathogen and it's the thing with the you know, I always tell the MGs only the young die good. So if you are seeing a uh emergence of those lovers, maybe you could get some control with the nosema, no low bait. But by the time they get any size to them, you got to run over them with the truck, a big truck. <laughs> or big okay. food. Good. So um, someone's wondering, will uh, T. radiata eat whitefly? No, but there are parasitoids and predators that will. Um, in particular, those um, as many parrot bugs are amazing for white flies. There are specialized parasitoids. I don't know if you can actually purchase them here. I've never seen them on the list. Um, the other option is, uh, and I didn't put it on here, but entry pathogenic fungi. So Botanigard works great. You can buy Botanigard ES at your local garden store. It is very easy to apply with a little pump hand sprayer. Um, and it works really well for things like white flies. That's great. And then Sandy wants to know, do the orange dog caterpillars like other plants? Um, they tend to prefer citrus, but they will feed on some other plants if that just happens to be where their eggs get laid. They don't look as fat and juicy um, if they go on a less preferred host. Yeah, so other members of the Rutaceae, uh, like our native wild lime, uh, Xanthoxylum uh, fragaria, I believe it is. Um, so one of the things you could do is to have that also in your landscape, and then you could do hand picking off of your citrus and move it to the other citrus. Um, I was thinking about that. So.